What's going on everyone? So tonight we're going to do something I've never done before. We're going to do a question and answer video covering questions I've received throughout the year I've been on YouTube. I'm going to cover these questions because I feel like they have a lot to benefit from my audience. They're very common questions that most people think and wonder before signing that contract to go to flight school. Most of these questions are going to be geared towards life after flight school, whether you're a warrant or an officer. Um, some of the, the questions are going to go over quality of life, how often you get to fly, what does your career look like, what's Army culture like. So this video is going to, going to get after that. So we'll jump right into it. The first question that I'm going to answer is, how is the Army officer slash warrant quality of life as a pilot in army aviation i feel like this is a great question it's a very broad question so my an answer to this question is going to be a little lengthy it's going to be lengthy um, for all of these questions because they are quite broad but let's get into this one so quality of life right so after flight school you're going to finish flight school you're going to report to your unit do in processing and then you're going to start progression Brand new as a warrant, once you get to your first unit, you're probably going to be assigned an additional duty. Um, really, the two most common additional duties that I see for brand new warrants or woges is what they are commonly referred to at the unit, um, if you're brand new, is fridge fund manager and publications manager. So fridge fund manager, just like what it sounds, you're managing the fridge. Uh, the fridge has energy drinks in it, Gatorades, waters, uh, a, a whole collection of drinks and beverages and snacks that people can just come in from flying, grab something, pop it open. Most warrants, uh, for at my unit anyways, have a Venmo set up that you can pay. Uh, the Venmo, it rolls right on to the fridge fund account and then the fridge fund manager takes all of that money from the week and he goes he or she goes to the commissary or whatever store they get the best deal at and they buy all of the supplies to restock the fridge. That's one of them. Um, the other one would be publications managers. So publications managers, exactly like it sounds. So in flight school, you'll learn about uh, DOD flip and all the publications that governor or that govern, excuse me, govern Army Aviation and the FAA. So you got your FIHs, your approach plates, your VFR sectional, anything with an expiration date. Those pubs expire. They have a, a life cycle. And that publication manager will go to the pay, place on base that um, supplies these publications and they will make them available and make sure they're all current and up to date in the planning room. Um, like I said, that's not going to be your only duty. You're, you're going to have things to do at the unit, but that will be, you'll be assigned that duty and that will be your responsibility. That's kind of like your first assignment as a junior warrant officer, along with progression. And once you're through with progression, being a pilot. Uh, for the officer, um, it's kind of similar, but, but different at the same time. You're going to have more responsibility. So I'm speaking from a medevac standpoint because that's all I know. I am uh, a uh, medevac officer. I only uh, have been in the medevac my entire life. I went in as a platoon leader, but I came in kind of senior. So most uh, lieutenants that are coming out of flight school that get assigned to the medevac will go into a section leader position you guys will will be kind of like an assistant platoon leader so you'll manage pretty much anything the platoon leader assigns you to manage for my section leader i use him to manage our property Property's kind of a big beast that it's you're accountable for a lot of things in the platoon there is a lot of things and i don't want to get into that on here but um that will be like a common thing that the section leader uh manages obviously it'll take time to learn that but eventually um, you guys will create a property book and and kind of as, um, advise the platoon leader on like hey sir like 
we went to the field. I think we need to lay this out. We had a, you know, this person left. He was signed for this, this, and this, and this person now needs a sign for that. So that's one thing uh, that goes along with section leader duties and responsibilities. And then another thing would, would be like taking meetings that the platoon leader is supposed to be at, but they can't be at for whatever reason, um, and speaking on behalf of, of the PL. Um, and then obviously progression and flying, just like the warrant side of the house. I'll get into these duties, um, more specifically the section leader and the PL duties and what opportunities the warrants have later on in life um, in another question, but that's where I'm going to stop this one at. Um, the next thing that falls under this question as well that I get a lot is pay and living expense. Like what's the quality of life for, um, you know, outside of work, right? Um, I've calculated it. So, um, a warrant fresh out of flight school, um, with two years experience. So not somebody who's gotten a lot of experience and then crossed over to the warrant side. I'm talking about more, more like a street to cedar that, that is his experience is limited to flight school and coming out. You got two years experience and then you're coming out of flight school. Um, you guys get paid typically around 65,000 a year and that's, all of your in, um, entitlements and everything combined. Uh, personally, for me, I, I made that amount of money as a lieutenant, and I was pretty comfortable on it. Um, obviously, if you have kids or you come from a background of a lot of money, maybe that isn't uh, comfortable for you. But for I would uh, think that that is comfortable for most people. Um, I've also gotten the question, do warrants live in barracks and do they have to eat out of the defect? No, they, they can buy a house, they could live in an apartment, they could do whatever they want. Um, unless, you know, the situation dictates something else like a deployment or something like that. Um, for the most part, go buy a house, go buy an apartment, eat what you want, live where you want, uh, just like a civilian. Um, and then same for officers. Uh, so I've gone over kind of like your, I'll, I'll touch on typical nine to five schedule. Cause that, that's a common question too. Um, your schedule is going to vary day to day. And I know that's not a great answer and that's a pretty common answer to get. Um, but nine to five, typically, uh, depending on your unit, you're going to do PT in the morning. Our unit fortunately only does PT once a week. It's on Monday. That's at six thirty to seven. Some units do PT differently. Um, I won't get into to PT too much just because it varies, but from nine to five on Mondays, you typically focus on maintenance, whether that be ground maintenance um, or aviation maintenance. They're handled on Monday where the entire company just focuses on maintenance, not just the maintainers, everyone. Uh, for Ground maintenance, that looks like PMCSing the vehicles, like, you know, checking the oil, checking the lights, turning it on, checking your generators, all of that. And then going over to flight line, you're getting on the AP, APU, you're loading ComSec, and you're just assisting anything that needs, um, that the mechanics need help with on flight line. So <clears throat> that's kind of like Monday uh, for the rest of the week. For officers, we typically have more meetings than warrants. Um, if you're a section leader or you're a platoon leader, the two most important meetings that you'll go to are the flight schedule meeting and the company training meeting. Flight schedule meeting, uh, if you're a platoon leader or, or filling in for your platoon leader as a section leader at the flight schedule meeting, you want to try to get a feel for what pilots need what in your platoon, whether they need, you know, uh, NVG reset, a hoist reset, um, if they need to get something signed off on their PC checklist that they haven't yet, you want to try to take that information to the flight schedule meeting and get that put on the flight schedule meeting. Uh, the company training meeting is, it that, that meeting is focused on operations of the company, whether that be you got to go to a range next week, you're, you're, you're talking about that, the people you're going to send the, to the range, who's going to oversee the range. Um, if you got an upcoming deployment coming up, you're probably going to talk about taking aircraft to port or taking vehicles to port, 
If you have a big exercise coming up, you're going to discuss that in that training meeting. And those are the two big training meet or those are the two big meetings that officers attend and other people in the company, but it's very officer focused. And if you're a platoon leader or a section leader, you're going to find yourself in those meetings weekly. So that's kind of a rough rundown on nine to five. Uh, again, because it's the army and you could be deployed to Europe, Afghanistan, Iraq, wh wh whatever the army's doing that day, or you could be at NTC, whatever you have coming up is really what the unit is focusing on and it dictates your schedule uh, from day to day. <clears throat> Excuse me. So typically life in garrison is pretty good. It's pretty laid back. You're flying, you're doing maintenance, you're going to meetings, um, but it's nine to five. You're going to go home, you're going to see your families every single night and you're going to get the weekends off and we have a lot of three day and four day weekends and you can take leave. Where things get a little stressful is when there's exercises like uh, the video that I discussed with the National Training Center. That would be an example of an exercise. If you got a deployment coming up or whatever, that, that's when the work-life balance kind of tips to the side of, of work more than life, right? Um, and that's kind of where the stress comes in. And that's kind of where the Army makes its money. And, and I'm not at all saying that exercises suck and deployment suck and we shouldn't do them at all because they are necessary. You get a lot out of exercises, you get a lot out of deployments, but that's what takes people away from your family and that's what stresses a lot of people out and that's what typically makes people say, I, I don't know if I want to do this past my obligation. Um, some people love it and some people continue. That's your own personal preference. My job here is is to give you guys what you can expect. So that's my intent and I want to make sure I'm giving you guys the full picture. So moving on to the next question. How often do you actually get to fly? That's a great question. So coming out of flight school, you're going to go into progression. I've covered this in other videos. I have three videos on progression. Progression at a medevac unit is typically, typically going to get you 30 to 35 hours. And I'm not going to go through what progression is, right? I have videos on it, and this video would be an hour long if I got into that. And I'm, I'm going to try to um, not make it an hour long. Once you get done with progression, you're going to start flying as just a basic pilot with the aspirations of one day becoming a PC. Um, when you're in progression, like I said, you get 30 hours, maybe 35, depending on if you need a reset or whatever. Hopefully you make it out with, with as less flights as possible because you want to get to flying with PCs because that's when you're going to fly the most. Progression, you don't really fly a whole lot just because you have to fly with a PC, or I'm sorry, you have to fly with an IP and normally there's a ton of people going through progression with you. So the frequency of you flying depends on where everybody else is and who else needs a flight out of the people that are in progression. <clears throat> progression also has to be balanced with A parts, which is an annual requirement for all aviators and IPs have to do them. So IPs don't just grow on trees. They are a limited resource and they do a lot. So like I said, in progression, you're not going to fly a whole lot. You're going to get your 30 hours. You're going to get signed off, hopefully. <clears throat> you're going to move on to flying with PCs. Once you've been signed off and you start flying with PCs, that's when you're going to start making your money. Um, when you fly with PCs and you're a fully progressed pilot, how often do you get to fly? I've been at my unit since August of 2022. It is now May of 2023, so I haven't even been at my unit for an entire year, and I've already flown 100 hours. That's a lot of flying. 
Um, that includes my progression time, but I've flown a lot since progression. And there's a couple of reasons why I've flown so much. And, and one is because I've gone to uh, the National Training Center and I, can, I participated in a, and my platoon participated in an exercise there. We got a ton of flight time with the cross country. We got a ton of flight time at NTC and we got a ton of flight time um, coming back. Um, and then train up to go to NTC. Uh, we got a fair amount of flight time for that. And then because there is a pilot shortage in my unit, you have way more opportunities to fly. So I understand that I'm not the story of everyone. You might go through progression. You might only fly minimums, unfortunately, which are about 96 hours a year for, for Blackhawks. Um, it varies airframe to airframe, but obviously nobody wants to fly minimums. They want to fly way past minimums. So it, I hate to say this, but it depends on the unit. It depends on what you're doing. You, are you going on a deployment soon? Are you going to an exercise soon? That's really going to dictate uh, how often you get to fly and what's the status of pilots. From what I hear right now across the Army, uh, we are we are short on pilots. I mean, I feel like it depends on who you ask. I feel like we're short on pilots, but that's my story here at my unit. So there, we have there's a healthy amount of flying going on. I, I fly at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. Uh, most warrants that are done with progression progression that I've progressed with fly three times a week. So they, they fly even more than I do. Um, and then once you make PC, you fly a lot more because you have a lot of opportunity because you're a PC. Um, warrants versus officers on how often you get to fly. As you guys know, I am a commissioned officer, and I just got done saying, I've already flown 100 hours this year, and I'm not even close to, to completing my annual uh, minimum. So 100 hours and, and roughly eight months is, is a lot, and I'm a commissioned officer. On the warrant side, you get to fly a lot more, and the reason why that is is because you guys don't have to go to the meetings, and you don't have to deal with property and and all of these other responsibilities so you're really your job and what the army pays you to do is fly yes you have your additional duties but your additional duties aren't so extensive that you don't get to fly um to where in the office in the officer community when you're you know you're doing property handover you're going to uh training meetings you might go to a command and staff meeting at battalion for your commander uh, flight schedule meetings, being expected to be at all these meetings and, and pl manage the platoon, you have um, less opportunities to fly as opposed to the warrants where they have a lot more opportunities to fly. So if you have any questions on that, please leave them in the comments. I'll, I'll move on to the next uh, question. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what does a warrant's career look like and what does an officer's career look like? I think this is a good question. So if you're a warrant, you're going to progress at your unit. You're going to eventually become a full-fledged, qualified, progressed PI that gets pushed out to the PCs and you start flying with PCs. Your expectations out of progression is obviously to fly every, every maneuver to standard, but overall to safely operate the aircraft. Bar none, that's really what you're going to be expected to do out of progression. As you climb up and accumulate hours and you get past 200 and you, you get close to 250, you're now starting to become more of a seasoned PI that's going to be expected to start really looking more like a PC. So instead of just flying the aircraft, you're going to be expected to be more on the radios and be more managing and your PCs are really good at doing this. They'll be like, hey, I want you to manage this flight today and I'm going to be the PI and I want you to tell me everything I'm doing wrong and how I can fix it. So even though they're still the real PC, they'll want you to act as, as the PC. Um, 
and then from 250 to 300 and when you finally get to that 300 you're going to start being seriously considered for PC depending on how well you're performing um, but really when when you get past really from the day of progression and really up to 250 hours you you're really trying to get that PC to have confidence in you to give you a yes in the PC board for pilot and command so when you make PC um, there are four tracks for warrants um, I think the requirement for all four of those tracks are at least 50 hours of PC time to even be considered for a track but these four tracks are what is going what you're going to kind of slide into and it's it's going to determine your career path so the first track for warrants is instructor pilot or IP so if you feel like you like standardization and you like teaching you're probably going to eventually become an IP or at least aspire to be one and hope that's what you what you track and from what I hear warrants can kind of pick what they want to track um, like I said, you have to have 50 hours at least, that's the minimum of PC time to go to any track school. But uh, typically you're gonna have like 100 to 150 before you go to these track schools. So IP is the first one and it's pretty self-explanatory. You're now going to go to IPC and you're gonna come back to a unit and you're now the IP that's taking student or yeah taking guys that have just finished flight school and taking them through progression you're going to be doing a parts and evaluate evaluating aviators on their a parts and that will be like an, a line ip eventually line ips turn into company sps which manage an entire company standardization program and once you've done really well at that job you're going to move on up and and become a battalion sp and then if you do really good you're going to go on to be a brigade sp and so on and so forth the next track is mtp or maintenance test pilot so maintenance test pilots everybody the one thing that everybody knows about maintenance test pilots is they know systems really well and they know how to diagnose and figure out what's wrong with aircraft and typically when something significant gets replaced on an aircraft they take that air aircraft that was broken and just got fixed on a maintenance test flight and they sign that aircraft off to say hey it's flight worthy it's ready to go back to the line now um, but also another thing that maintenance test pilots do is they manage um, maintenance programs and they run things called fl phase flows and they advise the commanders on how many lines he can put up on his flight schedule his or her flight schedule and that's typically what they do at the company so you got your company mtps your well in the medevac you got your platoon mtps your company mtp and then later on you have your um, battalion mtp and just like i i said about um instructor pilots it just keeps building up so that's kind of like the overview of of the M mtp track the third track that you could be as a warrant is a air mission survivability officer or an amso and amso's <clears throat> in a deployed environment they would be working closely with the intelligence officer or the s2 or the s3 and they would be gathering that enemy situation and that friendly situation and coming up with a plan how to best fly and keep aircrafts from getting shot out of the air whether that be from enemy weapon systems or friendly weapon systems that are shooting at high altitudes um, so that's one thing AMSOs do they also do a lot of classes that are required that we have to attend uh, annually um, that will be around when your A parts do. The uh, fourth and final track is the safety officer track. In the safety officer, I find that our safety officer does a lot of investigations, whether that be an actual incident that happened in an aircraft or an incident that involved an aircraft, whether it was a damaged uh, component on the aircraft or, you know, heaven forbid somebody got hurt. Um, and they basically figure out and identify what caused that and how units 
going forward can prevent that from happening next time. You know, I'm giving a very broad overview of these tracks, but those are the four tracks right now. There are talks in the Army of modifying these tracks or changing these tracks or combining them, but where the Army is right now, those are the four tracks for warrant officers. For officers, like I already mentioned, in the medevac, brand new lieutenant, you're probably going to go into section leader. And unless they're short on PLs, you might go into a platoon leader position. If you have some seniority and uh, you're coming in like me, where I was already a battalion medical officer and I had uh, a lot of time uh, managing medical operations, I went right into a platoon leader spot. Um, and like I already said, section leader, it's kind of like the assistant platoon leader. You kind of do whatever the platoon leader tasks you with. Um, a good platoon leader is going to assign very clear and un, uh, easy to understand duties and responsibilities for you. And you're going to just really work on special projects and be at places the platoon leader can't be. Uh, the platoon leader is going to manage the entire platoon from <clears throat> training, getting the platoon ready for exercises, and um, preparing for training going to these meetings and at telling the commander hey you know we're we're getting ready to go to ntc this is how i'm training my platoon we're doing high altitude training or we're doing dust landings and this is how we're training up for that you're also going to oversee going to ranges doing p uh where your platoon is on pt tests uh, personnel readiness the whole nine yards, literally you're responsible for everything that happens or fails to happen in the platoon. And then later on, you'll become a company commander. And then after that, you'll go to staff. And then after that, you will um, eventually take battalion command and maybe even one day brigade command. And uh, if, if you go that far, that's outstanding. Uh, don't forget where you started watching my uh, YouTube videos. The other thing I want to mention about commissioned officers is that we can actually track as well. It's not as common, obviously. Warrant officers, they are definitely going to track if they stay in long enough. Like, that is their career outlook. But commissioned officers also, from time to time, will get the opportunity to track. The most common ones you see in the officer community is uh, IP and sometimes MTP. Uh, the most common one I feel like is IP, and the reason why is because if a commander is a IP, they can go on these um, commander inquiries and stuff and kind of see and judge for themselves on where a pilot is rather than just taking an IP's word for it. Uh, it's very common to just use your IPs for that, but if you are also an IP as a commander, that is a huge benefit to be able to do. <clears throat> and you kind of can understand where the IPs are coming from as well. Um, as a tracked commissioned officer, if, if you get the chance to ever be an MTP, uh, you will probably find yourself managing a Delta company, which is a battalion asset for maintenance. That's typically where they wind up if they track MTP. Um, again, not very common for commissioned officers, but um, it does happen. So the other question we're going to move on to is advice on street to cedars. So for advice for street to cedars, um, I'll go ahead and, and give the very generic advice really quick on, on what I typically give, but <clears throat> study and pass your SIF test. Get that knocked out as fast as you can. Right after you get your SIF test done and knocked out and, and you pass it, you want to immediately schedule your flight physical. You want to get that knocked out as fast as you can, and the reason why I say that is because nobody's going to give you a letter of recommendation unless you've at minimum passed your SIF test, but most of the time made it all the way through your flight physical. <clears throat> That's kind of going to give somebody writing your letter of recommendation, uh, it's going to give yourself a little more credibility with them. 
Um, and then <clears throat> the third point is get a good letter of recommendation. If you're trying to go street to seat uh, for the warrants out there, you want to try to get a CW4. Um, I, I think that would probably be ideal if you have the opportunity to get a CW5. Those, those guys are very rare, but even better. And for commissioned officers, you're going to want to try to get at least a lieutenant colonel or higher um, for the commission side. <clears throat> My outside of generic advice, uh, one thing I will say is when you are approaching pilots as a street to seater or somebody aspiring to go to flight school, whether that be you're already in the Army or you're already in any component or anything, <clears throat> when you approach a pilot and you say, hey, I'm interested in dropping a packet, that's a, you know the common phrase, right? Make sure that you you've done your research and you have your shit together. And the reason I say that, and this, this doesn't go for the majority of my audience watching this. Most of my audience is more squared away than I was going to flight school. I mean, you guys are extremely impressive. Most of you scored extremely high on your SIF test. You got all of this educational background. Half of you guys have told me like, Hey, I've even knocked, my PPL out or I've gotten my private helicopter, which is phenomenal. And that's where most of you guys are. Um, and you've already done your SIF test. You've already done your flight physical and you're basically waiting for the board results. But I, I have been approached by a few people where they're like, Hey, I'm interested in dropping a packet. Uh, I'm like, okay, cool, man. Uh, do you, you schedule your SIF test? Are you already taking that yet? And they're like, um, I don't, uh, SIF test, um, I don't even know where, the, how do I do that? And it's like, of course, I'm not going to bash them or anything like that. But the thing is, the point that I want to make is if you're not even motivated enough to find your local testing center and schedule a SIF test and take the SIF test completely on your own. Like I don't, I'm not, I don't have confidence that you're going to spend three hours every single night in flight school when you're in common core trying to learn EPs and the systems and all of the aviation regulations that you have to learn if you can't even figure out where to take the SIF test at. I mean, so my point, my point is, is, uh, the more presentable you make yourself and the more organized you look. And when you come to a pilot wanting a, a letter of recommendation and you, you're like, I scored this on my SIF test. I'm done with my medical. I've gotten two other letters of recommendation. I wrote my letter of intent. If you'd like to see it, I'm hoping you give me a letter of recommendation. Like, those are the people that you're like, yeah, man, of course. Like, when do you need it by? But when you come to somebody and you don't even like know where to start. My point is everybody has internet access now. Like anybody who has the desire and truly wants to come over to this community and be a part of this, like they're going to do their homework on their own. They're going to research like, how do I take the SIF? Stif, uh, SIF test study guides. Where? How do I get a uh, class one flight physical for flight school? Like they're already, th those guys are so squared away that they've already like, they're so beyond that. Like the questions they're asking is like, hey, like what can I expect in Common Core and everything? So the more organized you are, the more initiative you have, the more impressive you're going to be whenever you're talking to uh, you know, those CW4s and CW5s or lieutenant colonels that are potentially going to uh, give you an, a letter of recommendation. So that'd be my advice. Just go after this like your life depends on it because when you get in flight school, it's going to take a whole lot of uh, self-motivation and initiative to get through flight school and do really well. Um, so... 
How is Army aviation as a culture? I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one. Um, it's a phenomenal question, and I feel like given the times that we're currently in, um, I need to give this question a lot of attention. So I want to start this one off by saying I am proud to be in the Army aviation community. I think it's the best branch in the U.S. Army. And one thing I love about Army Aviation is the pilots in the community is constantly striving to be better. There's no other branch where me as a, a commissioned officer and as a platoon leader where I can be sitting there doing work on my computer and my IP come in and say, hey, I want to know your torque limits for single engine, go. Or I want to know your TGT limits. And like you're expected to rattle them off. Like there's no other branch that's constantly testing each other to see where they're at on studying, on just being an overall better aviator and better at their skill, better at their craft. Like I love aviation as a community and being on the line with the pilots it's it's like i feel so lucky to be a part of this community it's in saying all of that there is a large consensus in aviation right now in army aviation that we aren't being heard on the line we just had a safety stand down that we dedicated an entire week to where the commanding general of every single post came to every single combat aviation brigade and TDY unit. And we did like two days of where we didn't fly at all. And we sat in an auditorium and we discussed how, how can we be safer as a aviation community? And this was in response to the, the recent crash in Alaska that took three lives. And then a month or two before that, there was the crash at Fort Campbell that claimed um, several lives as well. So this is the Army's response. The safety stand down was the Army's response to these crashes and these fatalities that have happened recently. And we're trending um, to have a higher accident rate than we have at, at, um, in many previous years, all the way up until 2015. I'm going to have to say that I was really disappointed in the conversation. That it, I don't think that it was as productive as it could be. And the reason I say that is because... I felt that we had a commanding general, we had the, you know, brigade commanders, colonels, battalion commanders, a lot of heavy brass in that room. And the big question they were asking is, hey, pilots, what do you guys need to do to keep yourselves safer? And the reason why that's frustrating is because as pilots, we mitigate risk every single day. None of us want to be in an accident. None of us do. We mitigate risk the best we can. We have a dangerous job. I feel like the most appropriate question that could have been asked there is, what do you guys need from us? Generals, Pentagon, Department of Defense level, what do you need from us to take to the highest levels we can take it to give you guys the resources you need to make it safer. I feel like that's what the question should have been. Not what do you guys need to make yourself safer. What do we need to give to you to make yourself safer? We try to make ourselves safer every day. We don't want to crash. We don't want, to, we don't want our friends to crash. Um, so <clears throat> that's the reason why it was frustrating. And... Um, 
uh, I don't, don't want to ramble a little bit, but I'm going to get into several points that I think are good ways the Army, the Army could make Army aviation safer. So this is my opinion. Disclosure, right? Um, so I think Army aviation need to stop making every single thing a priority other than aviation. I, I feel like, and I, I, I know all of my peers and, and friends on the flight line, my pilots, feel the same way is that there are so many priorities that take us away from just focusing on flying and being aviators. One of the things in particular here at Fort Riley is we don't fly on Fridays. And the reason why we don't fly on Fridays is because we have something called wellness. Now, uh, this wellness uh, program is very well intended. I don't want to sit here and act like it's a complete waste of time. It's not. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I think for aviation, since it, it is such a dangerous job and it is a very technical skill that takes a lot of training to be good at, I'm not sure that we should be giving every single Friday to focusing on wellness topics and we should be out flying and doing maintenance. I've added up the time. If you take the time that we dedicate to wellness, that is 1,100 hours per year that we are losing to wellness instead of translating that 1,100 hours into flight hours and into maintenance hours. 1,100 hours is a lot of time. When you give away every single Friday to only talk about, you know, just go sit in a classroom and talk about wellness issues or at what the, the topic that we've selected to talk about that day and to go play kickball or whatever the activity is, you're not flying, you're not doing maintenance, and you're not becoming better aviators. So that's 1,100 hours that could be rolled back into becoming better aviators. I feel like you could start with that one. Uh, the second one is reducing range requirements. In an aviation brigade, we go to the range two times a year. You're expected to fire your personal weapon two times a year. I think that's a, a great requirement to have for ground people, like, for example, the infantry, artillery, armor, um, MPs, like those, that, that's a great requirement to have for those guys. You must at minimum shoot your gun at least twice a year. But do pilots really need to go shoot their gun twice a year? I think it's reasonable to have a pilot shoot their gun once a year. Whenever I, I came from the infantry, whenever I was infantry, whenever I was an enlisted guy and I was infantry, whenever I called a nine line medevac request, I never once looked at the aircraft and said, man, I hope those guys on that aircraft shot their weapons twice a year. The only thing I ever cared about is how competent and well-trained the crews were on that aircraft <clears throat> that came to get the casualty. That's... And I, I think I speak for my uh, ground brothers and sisters. I, I think they probably care about the same thing, is that the pilots and the crews can operate their aircraft safely. So if you did take the range requirement only down to once a year, that's giving probably 100 hours to 150 hours back to the aviators to become better at aviating. Um, and it's not just going out to the range to shoot the gun. It's <clears throat> the range detail it takes to run the range. That's resource from aviation assets. It's PMCSing the vehicles and um, dispatching the vehicles that go out to the range. It's coordinating with range control. It's taking all of the people that need a fire and going to the EST and then going to a zero range and then going to the actual range. Like, that all takes time and hours away from maintenance and flying. And I think that if you scratch the requirement of 
the two times a year and only made it one time a year, you'd be rolling along with that 1100 hours, you'd be rolling more, <clears throat> you'd be rolling hundreds of more hours into our flying program. The third thing I think is the FAC1 minimum uh, flying requirements for a FAC1 position, which is every single person at the company level who is flying the helicopters all of the time, their minimums are only 96 hours a year. I'm speaking only from the Blackhawk standpoint. I do recognize that 47s and 64s have higher, um, I'm not sure of 47s, but I know 64s have higher annual minimums just because of gunnery and stuff. But <clears throat> 96 hours is barely proficient, enough hours to stay proficient at doing traffic patterns, let alone doing complex maneuvers like multi-ship, AMS, uh, combat flight maneuver, and terrain flight. Like you can't tell me that you can take somebody give them 96 hours and say hey we're going to go do a six ship multi-ship at terrain flight we're going to do it you feel comfortable with that anybody in their right mind would say uh i i could probably do it but do i feel comfortable like i think that the 96 hour minimum requirement for fact one positions needs to be increased to around 120. but that being said you can increase those FAC1 minimums unless you do the first two things, which overall bottom line is give more time back to the aviators to get better at aviating. The, this third point can't be accomplished unless those uh, first two points are accomplished because we're just not going to have the time. Um, those, are, those are three points I want to bring up. The fourth point is... <clears throat> Increase cred credentialing assistance from 1,000 back to 4,000. And I still don't even think that's enough. For those of you guys who don't know what credentialing assistance is, when you become, when, when you go to flight school and you become an aviator, you're going to become eligible for credentialing assistance. This credentialing assistance program allows you to go on to the, into the civilian sector and acquire, um, aviation certification so your private pilot license like your ppl for your fixed wing your instrument rating for your fixed wing your multi-engine like it it's it gives you money to pay for those things but i don't think a thousand dollars is is enough uh they decreased it about two years ago back uh down to to a thousand dollars that's that's not enough that's barely enough to even pay for headphones to talk on when you're in in the Cessna flying traffic patterns. A thousand dollars is nothing. It needs to at least go back up to four thousand, and I don't even think four thousand is enough. Your average PPL program is around ten thousand dollars. But the reason why this is important is because if you give more funding to credentialing assistance, that's giving aviators more money and more encouragement to go take their take their off time and, and use it at a local airport, getting more time flying in the national airspace, getting more time at control touch, getting more time at focusing on instruments and, and, and flying and operating an aircraft and, and operating at an airport and controlling an aircraft, which ultimately will in turn make pilots safer. And I mean, I get it, like fixed wing is not a helicopter, but it, it's, it, a lot of the things are the same. That's why military aviators fall under a restricted ATP, even if they are a helicopter pilot, because it's the same concept. The controls are just rigged a little differently. But that would make people safer. I don't want to ramble on um, with being on my soapbox here, but these are, I'm asked about Army culture in, in the comment section and, and Army culture and aviation. Bottom line is, I absolutely love Army aviation. I am honored to be a part of this community. I can't believe I was lucky enough to be selected to be a part of this community. However, we're not perfect. And I don't think um, it's fair for Top Brass to say, hey, how can you guys make yourself safer? I think the question that needs to be asked is 
how can we resource you with things you need to be safer? We want to do every single thing we can to make you safer. So tell me how we can make you safer so I can go up to my boss and my boss's boss and my boss can take it to his boss or her boss and we can get this talked about at higher levels to resource us with more funding and take some things off of your plate to put that back into our flight hour program. That's how you make Army Aviation safer. Um, again, I love Army Aviation. I'm proud to be a part of this community, but these are the things that need to be talked about in Army Aviation culture. So I hope this video was productive for, uh, for all of my viewers and all of my audience. I really appreciate the support. Please leave a comment. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, obviously subscribe. I love all of the support um, I get. All of you guys are more than welcome to reach out to me anytime you have a question or need anything. I'm always here for you guys. Good luck.